Hi, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second program of the Springs Pet Series. My name is Ariane and I work for the Ottawa Public Library. Um, so this year we saw that during the pandemic, a lot of people were adopting uh, pets and this has resulted in a huge demand for pet training services right when many training schools and pet stores are closed because of lockdown. So the Ottawa Public Library decided to partner with Rough House, which is an Ottawa-based organization that is a one-stop um, shop for all of your dog needs, including dog daycare, grooming, training, dog food, um, and a lot more. Um, and so together we'll offer you tips, resources, guides, and demonstration um, tonight and for the reminding uh, event in this series. For today's session on ownership, on ownership, we will cover topics such as grooming, vet visits and shot, food and diet, socializing your dog, um, surrounding yourself with the right team, and uh, much more. We will be taking questions throughout the event in the chat. Uh, so feel free to write the question anytime and we'll get to it um, either when we see it or if we are covering that topic just in a couple of minutes, we may wait to answer that question to get to, to that topic. So just leave them in the chat and we'll get to, to as many as we can before the end of the event tonight. So without further ado, let me introduce you to this series expert, Jonathan Sumner, uh, from the Rough House owner. So John is a dog enthusiast and advocate. His dog family consists of Burley and Maybe. Uh, Jonathan has had connection and passion for dogs since a very young age. And he, uh, after 18 years of experience in sales and businesses, he shifted his focus uh, towards his passion passion, which is the health and well-being of dogs and can canine education. So he has received training from the Animal Behavior College as a certified dog trainer, as well as certification from the Companion Animal Science Institute in Canine Nutrition. Um, so uh, please help me in welcoming uh, the one and only Jonathan Sumner. Have a good event, everyone. <laughs> all right, good evening, folks. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well enough. Um, if you cannot, please feel free to, to type that in the group. I'll speak loud and, and probably at times quickly, uh, partially because we got a lot of stuff to get through tonight. Um, I don't know if any of you were a part of the discussion last week, but we did go over pre-ownership. Uh, what we, you know, what things to consider pre-getting a dog, pre-buying a dog, pre-adopting. So we covered a lot of points there and we're going to pick off where we left off about now you've got your dog or you're getting your dog. So we've broken it down into six different groups. Feel free to throw out any questions as well uh, to the chat group. Uh, again, as Arianne said, we might tackle them right away or if we know that we're going to cover that material, we might postpone it a little bit. So we'll dive right in. Um, Hopefully uh, a lot of you have either gotten a dog or, or expecting, and if you have, uh, congratulations. It's a lot of fun, it's a lot of work, um, but it's very worthwhile. And you probably know that already. I don't need to tell you about it, but um, today we're gonna talk about getting your house ready, number one. How do we get our house ready for a puppy or a dog? Uh, and I'm gonna generalize throughout um, there's two different categories I want to look at is a puppy or an adoption, i.e. a mature dog. Uh, and there's some differences between those when you're adopting. Um, obviously, a mature dog comes with a history that we're unsure of, whereas a puppy, we know that we're getting them eight, nine weeks old. Uh, they're fresh to this world. So there's a few other things we want to consider when we're adopting instead of getting a puppy. That being said, like, Let's get our house ready. How are we going to puppy proof or dog proof our house? Well, one, we wanna pre-buy enclosures. Uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar, crates are a great tool. Uh, it's essentially a dog's den or their home. So it is a, it's a cage and it is an excellent tool to help you manage a dog when they're not around or they're not with you ensuring that they're safe and not getting into other things in the house. Um, 
we can also use enclosures, baby gates. Um, we can also use um, some wire fencing in the house, but pre-buy those things, pre-set it up, know where your family and your household is going to allow the dogs. Restricting access is not cruel. As a matter of fact, it's going to help the dog adjust, whether that's a puppy or that's a more mature dog. So pre-prepare for that. Don't get the dog and then, oh, we gotta go get a baby gate. We gotta get a crate. Have those set up and know where they're going to be. Have them be accessible to the rest of the household. Um, do a safety check. Go through like uh, puppy proof or dog proof your house. Things that you don't want to get eaten might get eaten, especially if you don't restrict their space. And restricting their space, again, is not something to punish them, it's to protect them. And it's to protect you and your investment in your house. So uh, remote controls, out of the way, glasses, uh, eyeglasses, that is, uh, kitchen glasses, um, anything that a dog could swallow. Uh, that could also be dangerous. You think about things like barrettes or hair elastics, uh, plastic combs, um, household items that you feel a dog could ingest. Let's get those out of the way. Let's not even tempt fate there. Um, supply them with items that you're going to want them to chew on that are safe. And we'll touch on that a bit later. Um, worry about cords, access to the back of the TV, um, electrical outlets, kind of a kid proof is another way to put it. Um, I find uh, a little tip for you guys, if you're going to use gates around the house uh, to restrict access to a room, don't buy a dog gate off of Amazon. Uh, you add dog to the, the term gate, they're going to put $100 on it. Order it online at Walmart, just order a baby gate. They're sufficient, they're strong enough. So go that route and they work great. I still use them in our house today. Um, when you do get a dog in the house, one of the overlooked tools that a lot of people feel it's only used for outside is a leash. And we're gonna touch more on this later, but don't be afraid to use your leash in your house. So whether you've got a puppy and getting them used to walking on a leash, having a collar on and being close to you, Again, you don't have to hang on to the leash at all times, but they're a great safety mechanism if you need to remove them from a situation or prevent something from happening, like you haven't gated off the stairs and tumbling down the stairs or anything like that. So um, the leash, again, is, a, is just a really overlooked tool. Um, I'm going to assume, though, at this point that the household has had a discussion already. We, you know, we talked about this last week about what is this going to do to our household if we get a puppy or a dog? Um, are we all on board with following the same rules? Again, consistency and upholding some boundaries is really important for your dog being able to adjust, whether that's a puppy or a more mature rescue. Again, upholding those boundaries and showing them things that you want them to do and avoiding punishment is really, really important to allowing them to adapt and feel comfortable in your house. So uh, again, the family should be in full agreement about what these rules are and what are we going to uh, enforce. Um, another, another good note is to, to have your feeding area set aside and have your, your toys set aside so they're easily accessible, at least in a couple different rooms for your puppy or your new dog. Um, have a lot of training treats on hand as well, because we're going to want to reward them for doing things that we want, again, to avoid any type of punishment or, or alternative um, reactions. So preparing the house is uh, it's a preventative means. Uh, you're going to learn a lot of things as you move through. Maybe your dog's a jumper, they go over the baby gates. Um, Training them and conditioning them though around a crate is going to be an excellent tool and I, I would not skip that for anything. You may have to take extra steps. So again, if you're adopting a, a senior dog that doesn't take to a crate, but again, case by case scenario and boundaries are a good thing. Okay, so getting the house ready is pre chaos. Part two is when you get the dog home. How do we introduce this dog to this new environment okay so puppy 
or mature dog, you're going to likely get a feel for that dog's temperament or personality. Um, is a dog shy? Are they cautious? Are they, is it a lab puppy that just loves everything? Charges in, wants to explore everything, life, life is their oyster type of thing. Um, either way, we still want those boundaries, but we're going to have to make some judgment calls based on your dog's temperament. Um, another thing I'm going to revisit in this introduction or, or visit for the first time is if you have another dog. So if you're bringing home a second dog, whether it be a puppy or a rescue as well. So as we go through, I'm going to try and, um, I've got a few comments here, which we'll touch on after the section. Um, we're gonna kind of go back and forth to introducing a new dog to the environment and introducing a new dog to another dog's home. Okay, so great rule, no matter what situation it is, let's explore outside before we go inside. Okay, we, we get out of the car, we put the collar, we have the leash on, it's safe, we don't know our dog's behavior, especially if it's a puppy. Um, introduce the outside of the house. This is a great time of year. It's not minus 40. Uh, we've got excellent weather out. So take in the smells, take in the area, walk around the house maybe once if you can. Um, it's a really good opportunity. I mean, if it was minus 40, you might handle it a bit differently but it gives you a chance to hopefully also empty their bladder or <laughs> let's do uh, the secondary movement. Um, but bringing a dog in before you get into the house is a great thing to allow them to relieve themselves. You can take a puppy or a new dog over to the spot that you think that might be their, um, their potty spot, so to speak. So take your time, especially if the weather's good. A lot, dogs love to smell. They're taking in the entire situation by sight, but a lot of smell, okay? Um, but if it is a puppy, and I've gone through this and I tried to figure out like, why won't this dog come with me? A lot of puppies might not have had a real collar or a leash on before. So be very patient, especially if it's a puppy or a nervous dog. And again, take your time. Because some of those puppies, they come out of the breeder, they've never had to go on a walk. They've never had to explore a new area with a leash and collar on. So just be really patient. They'll warm up to it, but it might be a slow process if it's a puppy. Number two, what if you have another dog? Well, I'm going to assume that the breeder or the foster home or the whoever you bought the dog off of or adopted the dog, that you already did, it, already did a meet and greet, that they already know that you have another dog and have maximized the chances of success. Is the other dog dog social? Are they protective? Are they, do they have any behavior issues? Responsible breeders and foster organizations will have gone through this with you. Now, a meet and greet is often the case ahead of time, especially if it's a more mature dog. Puppies, it's not always available because you can't have a four week old puppy, go meet your older dog. It just doesn't happen. That being said, the breeder is probably going to ask you about your other dog. How do they like puppies? How do they adapt to new dogs? So I'm going to assume these conversations have already happened. Um, when you get home, the outside before inside rule also applies. Let's not put our dogs at a disadvantage and bring them into a space that's really small. They feel threatened or forced into a situation. So I would take the dog outside. Bring your old dog outside, allow them to greet again or for the first time in a controlled situation. If you had a chain link fence, for example, you could allow them to meet on the other side of that, which provides some protection. Uh, but both dogs should be on leash. Um, again, for their own safety. But if they've already met, you're going to get a good idea how they intercept each other. So again, let's not rush this scenario allow them to smell, allow them to meet. And I have a trainer that says proper dog greetings, allow the dogs to go around the back end and he calls it learning the last name, which I thought was really funny, but that's a real important thing. If that's the sign that you get, they both go to the back end and they both get a good smell in, that's really good dog um, social skills, so to speak. Uh, but be watching their body language, be looking how they interact, 
if all's going well and they seem relaxed, now's the time you want to start looking at, okay, well, it's time to go inside. Now, your old dog, even though it's super friendly outside, he might not or she might not be so keen to go come into my house because for a certain amount of time that was their home. So I would bring the new dog in first. Allow the new dog the access to that area you've designated. That's going to be theirs. Allow them to smell and again, take in the new environment. Don't rush it. Watch their body language uh, to see how comfortable they are. Are they exploring? Are they hiding? Is their tail wagging? Is their tail tucked? And when you do bring in the other dog, let's keep the leashes on. Again, we want to be safe. Let's have a big enough area that they can greet and again, smell each other. And let's not force them into any small areas, whether it's a puppy or an adopted dog. Small areas would be your enemy at that point. But if all looks good, again, we want to keep them in separate areas. We're going to cover more on this later, but regularly for the first little while, while they adapt to each other. Instead of have, maybe having a puppy come in and jump all over your older dog or having a new dog have to figure out trial and error what the boundaries are, we want to help regulate that, okay? So err on the side of caution, uh, and there's a couple things to be aware of. Food, treats, and toys, two very high value things. Let's not have those laying about, okay? So those are things that dogs will uh, argue over. And having a new dog come in, oh, there's a food bowl on the ground. Other dog says, nope, that's my food. Again, we want to keep these things relatively separate until we really start to understand our two family dogs. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for a moment. Uh, and I'm going to uh, look at a few of the comments just to, to uh, address them so we don't get too far along. We had Lori, uh, my experience with the Chesapeake Bay Retriever rescues, since they are a sensitive breed, is, is overcoming behavior issues. Previous owners don't understand the breed and think they are stubborn, which they can be, but they're also sensitive. If they were abused, it can, it can break their spirit. We rescued two abused dogs and were able to give them a good home and bring them back to life. It was a good challenge to help them overcome bad habits, habits and learn to trust again. Yeah, I think that goes along, Lori, really well with the, I mean, it sounds like they were already bonded, but coming home and giving them that opportunity to adapt and learn a new scenario probably took some patience. And I think if there's an underlying theme to it, it's like, we want our dog to, to get in the house. We want to show our neighbors. We want to, everybody to meet this new addition. Let's look at it from their perspective. And it sounds like you did. And, and I know Chesapeake's are very sensitive. So again, we're going to look at your dog's temperament. Like I said, if it's a gregarious golden retriever, we might be less inclined to hold back, maybe go out and meet the neighbors. But if it's two rescues that might've been abused, yeah, it's going to take some time. Uh, Brad. Uh, any tips on deterring the dog from electrical cables? Um, yeah, uh, restricting access, really simple. Um, using uh, boundaries within the house. Um, if you're just talking about a, an outlet, you can use those plugins, but electrical cables, you can use the protective um, coils or use our, our uh, mesh dividers or crates for restricted access. Um, just not giving him that opportunity to get access to electrical areas is important. And I might assume that would be more of a puppy thing, but restrict access and don't give too much freedom. So if you have a puppy or a nervous dog that tends to be destructive, guys, too much freedom is our enemy, okay? Letting a dog go do what they feel they need to to calm themselves is going to result in trouble. So that's where we need to use our leash and use our um, designated areas as a, a tool to help your dog stay safe. So good question. Uh, I got Lori said, uh, I found it, whether a dog is a puppy or an older shelter dog, when they soil in the home, tell them no. When they proceed to take them outside, then take them outside to potty, 
once they potty outside, praise them a lot. Whenever they potty outside, praise them. If they have an accident in the house when you're not home, yelling or punishment after the fact is no good. Yeah, for sure. Puppy or older dog, again, this is more on the training side, so I'm gonna jump over it quickly. If you react to an action a dog took five minutes ago, you let the puppy or the dog out of your sight and they pooped in the corner, that's on us, that's on the humans because we did not manage their space. And they're not gonna understand why you're raising your tone or why you're saying, no, they don't know. Okay, uh, so it, it, I think it's a great point. We want to praise when they do something and not punish, punish when they do something bad. And we have to look at ourselves as the person who allowed that to happen. Okay, we're gonna touch on schedules a little bit later. Uh, we'll do one more and then I'm gonna jump back into it, guys. Um, from Allison, we got, how do you praise a puppy properly when potty training? Touched on a little bit a second ago. Uh, we don't want our pup to pretend to go because he's used to getting a treat after he goes. Do you give it treats or, or pets and lots of positive attention? Yes, spoken out loud. So with puppies, they do, they, they're, they're, they're smart little ones. They, they learn how to manipulate our, us as owners. And I think treats or praise are both fine, but we have to be very attentive when potty training. Uh, you develop a schedule and you have to be more stubborn than that puppy. Basically meaning you wait outside until they do both of their businesses, okay? A lot of puppies too, if, it, if it's raining or, or dogs, puppies in general, if it's raining or it's cold or it's uncomfortable out, they're gonna go and do the thing that they need to do most, which is usually pee, and they're gonna do it quickly. And they're gonna go, great, let's go inside. You go back inside and a minute later, they pooped in the corner. Again, we have to look at ourselves and say, okay, as dog owners, I need to be able to teach them that they don't come back inside until they do both of what they need to do. Um, so you gotta wait it out and tons of praise and their reward at that point is going back into the house. And they're going to learn through repetition with that praise. Yes, you poop outside. That, that gets what they want is usually to go back inside. So I think a lot of patience and marking that behavior with a yes or a good dog. I hope, I hope Allison, that answers your question. So um, there's some more questions, but we're going to jump back into it or else we might fall a little bit behind. Um, there, was a, there was actually one, John, that um, that kind of was related to what you were saying but it says it is is it a good idea to get a big dog cage to limit the puppy space inside the house at the beginning so to use the crate as a gated area to get it bigger uh yeah it's a i i would prefer a pen or a combination of a crate and a pen the reason being is if you get a if you have a small dog with a really big crate it's hard to make a cozy home. It's like making a bedroom in a warehouse for a puppy. Um, dogs like dens, they, li they like coziness, they like warmth, they like even a blanket over their crate. So if you were going to set up a crate for restraining purposes, especially for a small dog, that might be okay. Um, but you'd want a smaller crate that allows the dog at least to stand up and turn around as their bedroom. Um, I prefer a combination and we call them pens or X pens and they're essentially fold out gates. You can even clip them to the front of a, a, um, a crate and create an open area at the front of the crate if you have enough room. But if the, dog, the, the crate is too big, it doesn't create that situation where they might want to go sleep there or make it their, their, their den. Some crates too, if I'm thinking about it, they do come if you're expecting your dog to grow rapidly. So let's say you've got a boxer or a, a, a mastiff or something like that. A lot of the bigger crates will come with a divisor in the middle. So when the dog does get old enough, you don't have to buy two crates, remove the division. Now it's not big enough and allows the dog to grow into that particular crate. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Um, 
a lot of comments today, which is great. Keep them coming. We're going to try and um, jump into it. Uh, okay, so we talked about, it, again, getting into the house, but a um, couple things that I really want to stress if there are two dogs, again, is two, two, two separate eating areas for your dogs and understanding what they value and assessing their resource guarding. An easy way to have a situation within the house is to create a competition for valuable goods. So again, just keep in mind if you have another dog for a while, let's keep those areas separate, especially till we know how the dogs react together. Okay. Um, section four is let's not rush it. Just chill, puppy, new dog, what they want to do is they want to explore at their own pace. They don't want to be pushed. And you, again, you're going to be able to judge based on your dog's personality. Okay. I'm trying to cater to both sides. I think most puppies, I mean, there can be shy puppies, but they tend to adapt really quickly. Whereas an adopted dog is, is often a little more cautious. Maybe they've been bounced around. It might take them a little longer to adapt. So don't rush it. But what you can do right away is set those boundaries, including crate training. Number five is when you get into the home, create a routine, a schedule. I know it seems weird, especially with these COVID times, we're so not governed by the same schedule that we were before. When we had, you know, I left for work at eight, I would come home at noon on my lunch break for the puppy. We'd do a walk, a pee break. I'm back at four. It's still important for your dogs to maintain a schedule. Believe it or not, that's comforting to them. They know what's coming day to day. I mean, you don't have to do the same walk every day or play the same game or, but knowing that you, you feed at eight o'clock in the morning, we do a potty break and a little bit of a walk afterwards. There's another potty break at noon. Those really help you to regulate your dog's relief periods, especially a puppy. Um, usually two walks a day for a mature dog is good. More is gonna be needed for a puppy. And again, we're, you could even go as far as to write out a schedule for the month. So the whole household knows how to cooperate on that. Puppies will eat three times. So eight o'clock, noon, six o'clock. Just keep it consistent. And again, that will help a, dog, a more mature dog or even a puppy settle in even quicker. Enroll in training. Old dog, new dog. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's no dog that's too young that you can't do any training with. As soon as you bring a puppy home or a more mature dog, it's bonding. It's relationship building. It's trust. So those exercises you get to work with your dog, even if it's review, you get a mature dog home, they already know how to sit and do it down. Work with them. You know, you're going to figure out how much that dog knows or you're going to be able to teach them new things. But the more you do, the more your family does with that dog, you're going to get to know the dog and you're going to build a trust bond. And that's really what's the most important thing. Dog coming home learns to trust you. And again, we'll talk about training a little bit later. So don't, don't feel like you've got to wait on the training thing. Again, I can stress that. Get into a class, do a private session, even just work with the family in the backyard. That all really matters when you get a new dog into your house. Lastly, um, I could probably do a whole lesson on this. Um, I don't know, I can see a few of you, but if you had kids in your household, kids and dogs, whole other topic. Um, it's tricky, really tricky. Um, for a couple reasons. Um, more importantly, well, let's go over kids. Kids, let's say under the age of seven or six, they can be a dog's worst fear. Uh, dogs like dependability. They like predictability. We just talked about routine. They like to avoid really loud noises. So in general, kids that are quite young can be, and these aren't bad things, trust me. And these are just 
the way kids are. So they can be impulsive. They can they 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 react fast to things. They're energetic. And they can be loud. And the last thing we want to do is imprint a dog saying that kids scare me. You know, kids are, I don't like kids. And reactivity to children is a real behavior issue out there. And whether it's a puppy or a more mature dog, we want to teach our kids along with the rest of the family how to cohabitate properly. You know, because um, any dog, including a puppy, can nip or bite out of fear, right? Um, and it's hard to blame the puppy. You know, um, again, young kids, they may not be able to read the signs that the dog is saying no. Things like big bear hugs, we think of them as great things. We, you know, we love each other. I want to give you a big hug, but you may have heard this dogs don't like big bear hugs. You know, that's what kids might want to do. And they'll give off certain signs nonverbal until it becomes too much. So again, as a family and a household, we want to coach our, our, coach our children until they know the rules and know the boundaries. And what that does is, again, it allows your dog, new dog to succeed and it allows them to enjoy the process with kids. Okay. Um, very quickly, there's a three and three rule. And in the handout I send you guys today, it's gonna have a little graphic I borrowed but the triple three rule, okay? Very quickly, you bring a new dog home, whether it's a puppy or it's a, an adoptee, um, you wanna keep some things in mind. Three days in, that puppy's probably gonna be nervous. They're going to be testing things out. They're gonna be figuring out where they fit, okay? They don't eat for the first day, don't be too worried. But in a period of adjustment, that three days is really challenging for them to think my whole world's been turned upside down, right? So three days in, really tough. Three weeks in, you know, you might see them starting to become more comfortable, more of their personality starts to come out. Um, they start getting into a routine. You've gone five days without a, an accident in the house because your routine's working so well. Um, you really start to see things start to mesh. And you might start to see them test boundaries. Uh, meaning, what can I get away with? Okay, too. So that's where that consistency in the house is really important. That everybody upholds the same rules so that the communication is really clear to your new dog. Okay. So uh, for example, uh, if you've got a mature dog, they might start counter surfing. Wow, that's starting to feel comfortable in this place. There's uh, some cheese on the counter. And you come out and boom, the dog's up on the counter. We say no, we reward them for being on the ground. Again, it's likely a good sign though that they're starting to feel comfortable. We just stick to our boundaries. Then after three months, they start to figure out that this is probably permanent. This is gonna be my home, right? So. Um, you should be fully settled in with your dogs, start to really know their, um, their quirks. Um, they're going to figure out you. And again, even after that three months, a routine and consistency are still your best friends. Okay. But keep in mind those three, three days, you, 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 super scary, even three weeks in still going to be, uh, an adjustment period for them and for you. Um, but the graphics really cool. Uh, so Ariana, did you did you want to help out with some questions here? We've got a lot of comments and I wanted to see if we, we could run through some of them to help address what we've been going through. Definitely. Um, I have been receiving, there is actually one that says, is there any tricks for car rides, um, especially the long car ride home, um, if you go and get your dog or your puppy from a little further away? Is there any tricks, tips, things to avoid? <laughs> Yeah, it's a car, car it's a great question. Car, cars are something you want to get your dog acclimated to early on. So if you did go pick up your dog, I do think it's important right from the get go that we have a, a restraint mechanism. Um, I would prefer a, a, a crate. Um, but if it's the back of like an SUV with a cage, or a harness with a restraint, 
Um, those are all acceptable. But again, the car has boundaries as well, as, as does the house. As a matter of fact, the car can probably be a more dangerous environment not to have boundaries. Okay, so it's good to remain consistent and start from the get go. Um, but they also need to be comfortable with the motion of the car, um, the duration. So getting your dog home, if it's a five hour drive, you really have no choice around that. But from that point on, you do have choices and that's to create a positive association with the car, whether it's they get something great when they go in the car, they get to go somewhere great. Um, and if they are cautious, you may need to start small like that, you know, four hour road trip to, uh, to the lake might not be what you want to do if you've got a nervous dog. Um, we might want to start going out, sitting in the car for 10 minutes, petting them, giving them a few treats, jumping out, going back inside. It depends on your dog, but what we want to do is reprogram their association or initially program a puppy that the ride means something good. So I would say start small, have a restraint mechanism and start to build from there. Now, if the nerves persist or um, motion sickness persists or, or vomiting or, you, you know, you may want to talk to a trainer uh, about that and, and going a little deeper into conditioning or reprogramming their association with a vehicle and a trip. So biggest thing I could say is restraint and start small. Make it a good experience every time they go up into that car. A really great Thanks. question. Yeah, that's amazing. And Lori said, "What is the best way to handle a dog to gets car that gets car sick?" But I think you just uh, you just answered that. Um, and the rest is mostly just um, comments that I see. I I did see a previous questions above um, about food and how to change it. But I I do know you'll you'll be talking about food a little further on. So um, yeah. Just hang on there. We kept your question aside and we'll get to it later, but you can keep going, I think, John, for, for questions. Perfect, perfect. Well, I, again, they're all really good comments, guys. Thanks for those. Um, part three that we're going to cover, uh, that last section about introducing the dog was by far the largest content. So we're gonna be start to really cruise through some of these, but uh, picking your vet and scheduling your vaccinations. Usually with a puppy, they come with the first round you're going to have to identify your vet and start to schedule early uh, especially now during covid a lot of the veterinary practices are either full or they're booking a ways out so plan ahead if you can pick your vet early and schedule early uh, but plan on getting your, your 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 dog in for their regular vaccinations um, which will include um they're by request they're going to give you uh deworming medication, uh, tick medication, flea medication, but um, more importantly, uh, they're going to mandatorily give you DHPP or D2PP, which is uh, to protect against a number of distemper, hepatitis, parvo, parainfluenza, uh, and rabies vaccination when your puppy is old enough. Those are the two mandatory vaccinations that you're going to look at with your vet. Now, if you're going to make a note on this, I'd, I'd like to introduce an optional vaccine um, that you're going to consider if your dog's going to be in a kennel, in a dog daycare, or going to socialize with other dogs. The vaccine is called Bordetella, and it's to protect against uh, kennel cough uh, or canine cough as it's preferred now. So that is often not given automatically. You want to ask your vet about that. Um, you'll need to book your neutering or your spay in advance and, and the type of breed that you have might determine when that happens. For smaller dogs, um, you know, six, six months and onwards is probably okay. Um, a lot of larger breed dogs these days, they're waiting until a year or two years until they're fully grown to provide neutering or spay to them. Um, but you're going to want to book that ahead because, again, that's going to be important. Um, some things that annually you're going to want to consider, too, with your vet is dental care. This is ongoing. I can't stress this enough because my dog just went through $6,000 of oral surgery. So um, 
dental care and it wasn't from rotten teeth it was broken teeth but you can really prevent a lot by exploring options for you to to take preventative measures whether it's brushing your dog's teeth or additives to their food um but you're gonna want your vet to check on their their teeth you want to check on your like an annual physical how are they physically doing you're going to have to get the updated vaccination so those are, are things that you're going to want to do if you don't have to go still consider your annual visit um and then automatically you are either going to be looking at a, a microchip or a tattoo um but that aside you're still going to want to register with the community register your dog it's really important if they get lost they get away from you um, again, you have those initial identification things, tattoo or a microchip, depending on, on what your dog previously was given, but register really strongly recommend that. Um, and the last point is know where your vets are and not just your vet, uh, things come up, right? Thing, things pop up. Um, so you're going to want to know your vet, maybe alternative veterinary practice. If, if your vet's not open. And if where the emergency uh, veterinary services are, and I would probably list at least two or three of them. And I can tell you right now because of COVID and the influx of puppies and dogs in general, those 24 hour emergency services are often full as well. So they'll like be triaged the seriousness of your situation. So know where they are. If one says we're absolutely full, we can't take you, you know exactly where to go. Otherwise, if you have a scenario. A scenario like my dog, who I have two. I have a Rhodesian Ridgeback who doesn't get into any trouble. And I have a American Staffy, a, a pit bullish type dog uh, who likes to get in trouble all the time. And we went out for a little stroll. She sees a golf ball, picks it up, swallows it. Okay, so called the first vet. Sorry, we're really busy. Went to the second one, they could see her right away. So it was a, a situation that could really help you if you get anything uh, that needs to be looked at right away. Um, part four. We yeah. We actually had a question that um, is linked to that topic a little bit. It says, in speaking about the medical and dental needs and veterinarian needs, um, do you have any views to share on pet insurance? So we talked a, a little bit about that last week, but for those who, who were not there, uh, on on pet insurance is that is that the question yes for me it, it's been really beneficial um i think those of you that like peace of mind uh insurance is really valuable um they'll often pay you back depending on the condition somewhere in the ballpark of anywhere from 60 to 70 percent uh, that's great if you get a serious situation you know, whether it's the golf ball or, or, or teeth or something different. So for me, investing $100 a month and not being blindsided by a $6,000 bill, it definitely helps me. But it's a personal preference um, for you, whether you decide to go with pet insurance or not. Really good peace of mind, though. Hopefully that, that uh, answered the question. Um, there's one here that, that we're moving on to is part four. And more or less, it's something that every dog in their lifetime is going to need. And owning a business that has a grooming salon in it, um, I have learned a lot about the upkeep needed for dogs in general. Um, so preparing our dogs to be groomed. And this includes something as little as a nail trim. So our job as uh, owners, as, as leaders of the house, is to prepare our puppies and our dogs the best we can for all scenarios. And that includes visits to the vet, which can often be stressful. Grooming is as stressful or more stressful than the veterinarian. I can tell you that it, it, and I'll explain why. Um, hair dryers are super loud. They're not like your hair dryer at home. They're three times as loud and it's so that we can get the water out of your dog's fur or their hair. Um, 
scissors or foreign objects, things that vibrate like a razor, those are all really foreign. So how do we get our dogs ready for the vet? And this is something I, I, I really think is overlooked. Um, is desensitize them, much like we talked about the car, is to try and create a positive association with these things that they're going to encounter as much as we can. You know, I think not every dog is going to love getting groomed or haircut, but we can make it a lot better than like code red, our dogs freaking out, right? So how can we do this from the time we get our, our adoption dog or our puppy is start to handle our dogs regularly, feet, ears, tail, tummy. Um, if you've got a long haired dog whose hair is going to be cut regularly, fortunately I have a COVID beard so I can demonstrate for you guys, but um, you're gonna get used to holding your dog's hair on their chin. So this is a groomer's way of controlling the face when they have sharp objects near their eyes or their mouth. So they're able to, so if you're doing that with your longer haired dog, feeding them some treats, being really gentle about it, you're able to desensitize them to that situation. You don't want the first time that that happens to be on the grooming table with really, really sharp scissors. Um, touching our feet, touching their feet is a way to desensitize them. Now, dogs' pads are really sensitive, but again, they will get used to it the more you do it. And again, we might have scissors near their pads. In particular, we're gonna have nail clippers. Now it's really hard to practice this at home, but if you have something that clicks while you're holding their feet, you have somebody else feeding them a treat, you can start to desensitize that situation. Again, you don't want a dog that will choke themselves on a tether to get away from nail trimming. It's really, really difficult and the alternative is paying, I would say probably three or four times the amount by going to your vet. Um, because it's a service that is not deemed veterinary worthy, they'll do it, but they might have to sedate your dog. You're looking at a couple hundred dollars to get a nail, nails done. Where at the grooming salon, it costs 10 or $12. So the, the payout and the stress avoidance that you can have by decondition or reconditioning their thought around things in their feet is really key. Um, getting your dogs used to something that vibrates. I know it sounds really crazy, but if you get an um, electric toothbrush from the store, or if you have a razor and you pop the razor out of it, having them used to that, that, that vibrating object touching them or touching their feet, touching their chest, touching their back, and having it be less stressful. Again, maybe they like treats, maybe they like pets, maybe they like praise. But going through this and going through a lot of repetitions of this is really gonna help your dog. Again, I say that because I see so many dogs that haven't gone through this and they do backflips on the table. They will, um, they will literally kill themselves to get away from a grooming situation. And we wanna avoid that. Different dogs will need different grooming. So again, if you've got a short haired dog, you're probably looking at a bath every three, four months, maybe six months, depending how much grub your dog gets into. Uh, whereas a longer haired dog, you're looking at a groom and a, and a bath every couple months, two or three months. And that's key. Really, really, really key. And he said, wow, he said that three times. Well, I see a lot of doodles. And I don't know how many of you guys are considering a relative to a, a, a doodle or any type of oodle. Um, COVID shut us down earlier this year where grooming was deemed non-essential. And I think a lot of owners weren't prepared for that. They weren't educated in how to keep up their dog's coat. Uh, and we reopened. So we have went three or four months for some of these long haired dogs with little upkeep. And they brought their dogs in. And, we encountered severe matting. And I don't, some of you guys might know what matting is, but essentially it's a dreadlock. And when dogs with curly hair or longer hair get matting, it twists. So if you can imagine when you twist a, spin a, a garbage bag, when you've got 
garbage in it to kind of seal up the top and then tie a knot in it, the hair keeps spinning and twisting until it pulls the skin. It can literally leave purple bruising on a dog's skin and the hair is not recoverable. Okay, so upkeep and regular grooming appointments for dogs that have long hair, I can't stress that enough. Um, really important, one, you're gonna help your dog avoid discomfort, um, sometimes severe situations. Uh, if the matting happens on the ears, when the blood rushes back to the ears, you could have hematomas, meaning your dog's ears fill with blood. So the upkeep of long-haired dogs, I can't stress that enough. However, if we wanted to go an entire grooming lesson, we'd be going for, for hours. So um, judge on your dog. Long-haired dogs are going to need more grooms. Short-haired dogs are going to need obviously less. And all dogs are going to need their teeth done uh, regularly, their nails done, maybe their ears cleaned. But again, they're all going to have different grooming needs. All right. Talking about food, we got two sections left. So I'm going to rush through this. Food is something that I'm super passionate about. Um, and again, this could be an hour or two hour conversation, but it's like influx of, it's over flooding of information. Um, 50 years ago, there was Purina and another brand that was on the shelf. You just bought it, brought it home, fed your dog. Um, a lot of breeding and inbreeding, cross lines. We, we've started to see allergies become a major issue, food sensitivities, and the choices, choices are infinite. They really are. Like if you were to go, like our store, we sell five really high quality foods. Uh, but if you went to a, um, a warehouse store, like a PetSmart, you're looking at choosing between 30 different brands of food and where do you start? And on top of those 30 brands, now you've got different types of food. You've got kibble, uh, you've got raw food, uh, you've got freeze dry food. Now you've got home cooked diets. There's pros and cons to each of those except the home cooked diet. Um, what I'm gonna say to that is just don't do it unless you're a nutritionalist. Um, all of these other companies have employed professional nutritionalists that balance the formulas that give your dog everything they need to be healthy. And unless that's a full-time job or you really know what you're doing, leave it to them. I would hate to see your dogs get deprived of a certain mineral or nutrient and have health problems because of that. So some things to consider again, for another topic, we can talk about all the different types of food and the pros and cons around them. But the things you want to look for is you want to look for food quality. And you're going to have to budget accordingly. And everybody's different. What you're looking at for the price range of, let's say, a 25 pound bag of food is a range from $20 on the shelf at Walmart up to about $110, $120 in a boutique store. And there's lots of middle ground, right? Get as good quality as you can get or you can afford, okay? Often, often price does equal quality. And the big difference is the quality of ingredients. Rule number one, if you look on the back of a kibble bag, and what you see is like chicken meal or a processed food first, it's likely that that's a lower quality food. Just like us, we have processed food, we have organic food. If you see a pure protein first on that ingredient list, like chicken, lamb, or beef, and the, and the bag for 25 pounds is $50 and up, you're, you're in that right direction of really quality food um, to help your dog remain as healthy as possible. Okay. Second thing there is look for a brand that has different protein sources. So a brand that will have chicken, lamb, beef, turkey, and pork, you're going to want to create a rotational diet. Every month or two, three months, switch up the protein. It helps keep it interesting, but it avoids food sensitivities or allergies. Okay. So like I said, um, 
I think food, given enough demand, is worth an, another another hour conversation in itself. But those few key things is look at the price tag. Again, buy what you can afford and look at pure ingredients first. Part six, socializing and dog parks. Um, dog parks, be warned, people, be warned. There is some pros you can extract from dog parks, but there's also a lot of harm that can come. And I'm going to go through these because I know we're pushing the time a little bit here. But um, if you're going to go to a dog park, I refer to this as the dog piggy bank. We work so hard in giving our dogs positive experiences with everything, right? Um, new people, new dogs, new scenarios, walks to the park. And this piggy bank, we start to fill it full of positive experiences every time there's when we drop a, a coin in there. And we work so hard, but there's so many variables when you get to the dog park that work against that and can drain that piggy bank in one situation. So I'm not saying don't go, but I'm saying be aware because it's not often your dog that you have to worry about. If you do go though, make sure that your dog has a good recall. And I think any dog under one probably doesn't have a good recall, especially in situations that are important or exciting, okay? So make sure that you work really hard on that recall and it's fairly dependable if you go to a dog park. Um, even if it's not perfect though, you can use your judgment. Be watchful, you're, you're a dog parent. So if you're entertaining going to the dog park for exercise and socialization, if you feel uneasy about another dog or uneasy about another owner, maybe the owner is too busy on their phone and their dog's playing too rough, it's okay to say no and leave. Okay. I would rather you be precautious and preventive than have a situation to deal with, right? So let's keep that piggy bank full, but if you are gonna take the risk, be okay walking away and using your judgment to protect your puppy or your dog. Lastly, know your dog and they should have a fairly bomb-proof personality. And what I mean by that is a balanced personality. They know how to take a correction. They know how to give a correction. They know what recall means. And they know how to play appropriately. And let's just not put them in a scenario that doesn't allow them to succeed. Okay, so know what you're getting into going to dog parks. But what if something does happen? How do you deal with conflict? And I can speak from experience. Um, it's really, really hard, super hard. You've got your new dog, your dog's eight months and cute as heck, and another dog bites him. It's really hard to remain calm. Everybody's heightened at that point. It's your fault, it's your dog's fault. We have to be able to dial it down and assess the situation, assess the injury and the dog situation first. Is everybody safe? Is everybody okay? Um, and a conflict usually takes two sides to get heated. So if we can remain as calm as possible, given a situation, it's going to bode to your benefit. Um, think about it as like a fender bender. Let's exchange some, some information. Um, hopefully both sides are reasonable, but again, at dog parks, I can't guarantee you that. People are often possessive or defensive about their dog's actions. So remaining calm is preferred, but again, it's the other people that I can't guarantee for you. What would happen though, is if everybody is good with the situation, you know what, I'm really sorry, my dog was out of line, you would exchange information and a responsible owner, if their dog had inflicted any form of injury on another, would offer to pay that service. Now, if you, you're dealing with an owner that is aggressive or belligerent or defensive. I mean, the chances of getting anything, anything out of that situation are very slim. Um, you're best to report it to bylaw. R report a bite to bylaw, whether it's to yourself or your dog. 
it should be on record, especially if the owner uh, is not copying to it. If they won't give you their information, um, report the dog and what the owner looked like and they'll do their best to track them down. But again, it gets really tricky. And that's why dog parks are such a slippery slope. Um, but where do you go instead, right? Well, there's a few options and it takes a little bit more effort. Um, you can go to a local, local park. You can look at um, Facebook groups are great as well. Uh, Ottawa Dog Group, Doodles of Ottawa, German Shepherds of Ottawa. They've got countless groups. Set up play dates for dogs that are a similar age and size and play style. Or just dogs that you meet around the neighborhood. They, they get along great. Can we go to the, the park, you know, have them play? Make sure it's a, a fenced in park that is. Um, or if your dog doesn't get along with other dogs so much, go in, in off hours, go earlier, go later. Um, develop some games, some, some recall games and some fe fetch is great for exercise, stimulation. Um, consider a dog daycare, right? And that's not a plug for us, but it's run by professionals and it's managed and supervised so that it is a positive experience. And again, look at group training classes. That gives them a lot of mental stimulation and exercise, something like agility is a great way to go. So if you don't go to dog parks, it's important that you do know that, that there are some options. And lastly, we're gonna to touch on this and this is a pretty quick one then we'll deal with any questions is, how do I get it right? How do I not screw this up? Well, you've got a lot of people to help you. You know, we, we've, got, uh, we've got to choose our partners and our people right. So depending on our dog, what is the right needs? Again, is it a daycare? Is it a dog walker? Um, we need to pick the right vet. And how do you do that? Call them. Ask to speak with the veterinarian. Look at reviews. Reviews are really key. Dog groups as well and social media, they're going to give you a ton of feedback on local veterinarians. Good experiences, bad experiences. Do your homework. It doesn't have to be the one that's right on the corner near your house, or it might be. But again, you as a pet guardian are allowed to make that assessment and trust your gut. All right? And the same thing goes for a groomer. We talked about grooming being a traumatic experience. When you look at a groomer, look at the reviews, talk to the groomer. Ask to see their salon. Do they have 20 dogs in there that are barking with 30 fans going? Um, are they going to be crated? You know, maybe your dog doesn't like to be crated in that scenario. Um, do they do one on one grooming? Are they humane handling? Read your reviews, talk to the groomer, and make that assessment, right? And is your groomer honest with you? I think honesty, which is not always the best to hear, but it allows you to improve your situation. Does your groomer tell you that your dog struggled on the groom today, that he was trying to bite my vacuum in half, or he was great? Because if they tell you, they want your situation to get better. So you can assess along the way about your groomer. You can always change. Lastly, what type of training do we need? Now, this is a, a great segue. Uh, we're three minutes over. Uh, our next week is talking about training fundamentals, going through a guide about picking your trainer, understanding the fundamentals of training and choosing your philosophy. Now, the process of choosing a trainer is not any different than a dog walker, a dog daycare, a groomer or a veterinarian. They should be reputable. They should be certified. Okay, you have to ask them what their certifications are to teach. And lastly, you need to make a decision understanding what positive reinforcement is, what balanced training is, and what aversive training is. And we're gonna go more into that next week, but if you're doing your research, those are the three approaches to training that you're gonna to wanna to understand in choosing a trainer. That rounds out our points. Ariane, I see you jumped in here, so I can help answer any questions upon exit.
Yeah, I mean, there was two questions specific to uh, food when you were talking about it. Um, uh, someone asked if there's a brand of food that you particularly recommend. And someone else uh, said, how do you know what supplements are needed for new dog owners, joint supplement or, or whatever, which one to, to pick if you're new to this? Okay, those are, those are two excellent questions. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I have brands that I like, but their website will often give you a good idea about what their mission statement is, uh, how long they've been in business, and you can Google how many recalls they've had. Now, a good sign is they have a high quality manufacturing and they haven't had many or any recalls of their food for contamination. Okay, so um, I like higher end food personally because I feel like it creates longevity and a healthier situation for my dog. But do your homework on your food, look at their website. Um, but as far as a brand, it, I feed my dogs raw. Um, so again, a conversation around feeding, but without trying to persuade you one way or another to a particular brand, um, you can always call us at the store or you, you do your homework and, and look at what their mission statement is and look at the quality of ingredients. Mm -hmm. And as someone else was also asking um, when having to change food. Uh, so I don't know if it's that specific to like coming from the breeder or something, you're transitioning type of food or stuff like that. But how do, long do I need to wean them off um, old before introducing the new food or is there a, tr good a way question. to transition? I, yeah. Good question. I, I realized I, I missed out on, on, on a topic just earlier. You would ask me about supplements. Um, if you're feeding kibble or any balanced formula, whether it's raw or kibble, you shouldn't really have to add anything to their diet, but you can. Okay. So it's not a real, concise answer, but it's like us. If I have a relatively well-balanced diet, which I don't during COVID, but if I did, I could always take extra vitamins or supplements. And the same thing with your dog. But I would say that anything to do with joint health is, is a great place to start. Anything to do with glucosamine, and there's some brands out there that are better than others, but joint health is something I would definitely add no matter what type of feeding you're doing. And then that last question that you had gave me was a transition question. Uh, transition, it, I would try, okay, let's start. Most puppy food that you get, almost all puppy food is chicken based. It's because their, their stomachs aren't developed. The enzymes to digest some of the richer proteins aren't built up yet and chicken's fairly bland. You know, we can make a very bland meal for ourselves with chicken and rice to help balance out an upset tummy. So for puppies, chicken is largely 99% of the puppy food, chicken-based. So if you're going to transition to a new food, you can do a few meals of mixing, you know, 50-50 of the food. But I would try and keep it in that family of chicken protein as long as your dog is doing well on that protein. You introduce the new food. And after three, four or five meals, your dog still has loose stools, uh, they vomited or they got, you know, even worse diarrhea. Maybe we need to rethink the type of food we're moving over to. It should take like maybe four meals top. So. Okay. Um, that should be a quick question. Uh, is there such a thing as baiting or cleaning a puppy or a dog too much? Yeah, I think you yeah. said like three or four months. So like, what's too much? <laughs> too much would be, you know, every couple of weeks. Okay. Um, dogs have a, a, a you know, a, a certain amount of oil that protects their body and we can deprive their hair. Uh, even if we're conditioning their skin and their hair of those essential oils. So, as a rule of thumb, I re unless they really need it, I wouldn't be bathing our dogs more than once a month. You can do it once a month and do it relatively safely, but if you're planning to do a bath every week, it's probably going to be more detrimental than healthy. Okay. 
Um, is it bad and not going to dog parks and or not socializing your dog with other dogs? Well, yeah, we touched on yeah, So again, a really good question. It's uh, dog parks are love and hate for me. I've had great experiences and I've had some really bad ones. Um, so I, if you've got a nervous or shy dog and you're, you're still building up that trust with your dog, uh, I would prefer to go the alternative routes that we talked about is play dates, um, known neighborhood dogs, um, limiting the amount in the group. Um, do not introduce toys or anything else into that playtime. Um, one of the things I hear, and I, I, we had a dog come in last week, was that their dog went to the dog park and got a chunk torn out of the side because they went near another dog that had a stick. And that dog loves sticks. And he said, this is the most important thing to me in the world right now. So I'm going to scare you off, bit the other dog. And those things we can't control going to the dog park. So that's what I worry about in saying that to choose controlled or safer situations um, is preferred. So arrange play dates, smaller groups, uh, dog daycare, um, and go to social media. I said, great, great option these days to set up play dates. You might even find litter mates of your dog. Okay, so we might have time for one or two last question. I know there are still some more coming in and we may not be able to get to, to all of them. Um, but there was one, uh, maybe um, if that's something you'll touch upon next week a little more, you can maybe uh, close, um, say that and Bridget there, but it says with COVID work from home, obviously you're more present with your dog. You're there all the time. Uh, how do you manage um, the situation to reduce future separation anxiety? So is there a way to try to prevent that uh, separation anxiety or stress um, for when we go back to work, maybe in a, another setting and yeah. won't be home all the time? Fingers crossed uh, for, for some normality and, and healthy situation. That is a, a, an excellent question. Um, and it's one that that's, I think we're, we're going to see a lot of problems. Um, we already are with dogs that were completely okay being alone prior to COVID. And I, I knew these dogs excellent and their behaviors completely changed. Um, so the biggest thing I can recommend in short would be looking at your schedule and including downtime or timeouts in their crate with you at home. Continually teaching them that being alone or having downtime is okay. And if we completely forget about that and then flick the switch when we go back to work, we can almost automatically expect separation anxiety and um, almost a retaliation of sorts, like um, an overwhelming sense of I'm alone then they get into trouble. So um, practice consistency and build that into your routine. Um, and it should help um, combat that separation anxiety you might see later. And uh, a quick easy one, or I don't know if it's easy for you, but uh, yeah. what kind of leash or nest do you suggest? <laughs> There's a ton of options out there. I, I, we operate a, a positive reinforcement and humane handling. So I avoid anything that would restrict or cause discomfort. So I, I, I avoid anything to do with a prong collar personally, even Martindale collars, which tighten a little bit. I prefer not to use them. Um, personally, um, as they're a puppy, I think you can choose any collar or harness that fits them comfortably. Uh, as they get older or bigger, you're gonna wanna assess whether they do better on a collar, harness, or both. But my preference for a collar is one that has something like a belt buckle to it versus the clips that we see. They're, they're, they're super prevalent, in like backpacks, everything like that. Um, but Ottawa has some harsh weather and in winter I've, I've seen cases where those clips break. So if you've got a bigger breed or, or a bigger dog, I prefer something like the more traditional belt where the thing goes into the hole and it's kind of got a clip. Um, 
versus that plastic button, if that makes sense. It rule, does. Rule, <laughs> rule one, though, it, again, it, uh, these questions, there's never any short answers, Ariane. So uh, um, with a, a collar, is it too loose or too tight? Um, you, you're going to have to make that assessment where as a puppy, they're small. If you can fit one, if you can fit two fingers and turn them, it's too much. If you can fit one, that's just enough room. It should be fairly snug as a puppy. As they get older and bigger, two fingers, and if you can turn them just barely, you're good. If you can fit your whole hand under the collar, they're going to be able to flip out of that pretty easily, and it's an unsafe situation. So same thing with harnesses. So side, if you're not comfortable sizing them, have somebody help you size them properly for comfort and for performance. Okay. Well, I don't know about you all, but I, I could stay all night just talking about, <laughs> about dogs. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, it's all for, for today's program. We need to, to end it for tonight. Um, thank you very much once again, uh, John, for your presentation tonight uh, and for Rough House for, to partner with us for this amazing series. Um, we hope you enjoyed the program and learned a lot um, and found it useful and informative. Um, all of you, just a special note, um, we will send uh, documents uh, via email tonight. I will send back uh, the documentation from last week uh, to everyone that was here tonight as well. Um, so that is not an issue. Uh, if you want to join us next week, um, we will also have a program next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, also, it's going to be uh, just like John mentioned on the training uh, fundamentals and uh, um, what type of training is there, what time and monetary investment will be required. So a lot of things about that um and so we hope to see you then so care of yourself uh your family and your furry friends bye everyone thanks thanks john <laughs> thanks guys